you about the sports stadiums. Over the last few decades, there's been a, a huge increase in the um, field of um, the economics of sports. And uh, virtually every study that's been done on these publicly financed stadia and, and those kind of things show that the return on them, what the government gets for the money it puts up, is slightly negative. Sure. Occasionally they get one that's a little positive. But they all say, I mean, when they sell these things and say, if you put a billion dollars into this stadium, it's the multiplier is going to be two, and you're going to get $2 billion of benefits. It, it comes out that they get a negative return on the investment. Yeah. Which is why L.A. wouldn't build a stadium for this football team that's going to go out there now and told the NFL, we got the big market. If you want to come here and have this big market, you build a stadium. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they want to do, you know, they, you know, they want to do the whole entertainment complex and all that. And, you know, the market supports that. That's wonderful. Yeah. But it doesn't. So those were the, um, the three cases I, I wanted to, to um, chat about, and then we have plenty of time for questions. But um, just to give you a little peek behind the curtain in terms of how we decide to do these things. So we obviously, we'll take cases that align with our priorities, kind of really government for free market priorities. Um, but we want them to have real world impact. We want them to make a difference uh, in the lives of as many people as possible. We also want cases that can create significant precedent. So this gift clause case created precedent that not only applies to these publicly financed deals, um, but you know can apply to pension reform or to uh, you know uh, the public union abuse like release time, um, and that can be replicated elsewhere. So using provisions that can be replicated elsewhere. So an ideal case will have you know simple facts. Um, everybody understands a hundred million dollars for two hundred parking spots. That's it. And that's pretty simple for like the average person to get. That's Seems, that seems uh, pretty simple. They also typically will have out outrageous facts. I mean, that's pretty outrageous. Like, what is the what is the government doing, spending that much money on this little little uh, benefit? Typically, it'll be symp symp sympathetic plaintiffs. Um, um, additionally, non-traditional. I'll actually talk about another case where there's um, where the plaintiffs really matter. Um, non-traditional alliances. So somebody might think of a free market organization like the Goldwater Institute as pro business. You know, we you know embedded in the chamber of commerce or whatever. Um, business interests sometimes hate us because we're like, hey, look, you know, what are you what are you on the public dole for? You know, um, when we went after City York, that was really um, we got a lot of heat, you know, from the business community. So there's a, you know these uh, these non-traditional alliances are often helpful. Um, carefully developed legal theory. The gift clause had been laying kind of dormant in Arizona for a long time. It was just waiting for a case like the City York case to come and give it some teeth as it is in a lot of states. <laughs> and courts, importantly, are evolutionary. They're not revolutionary. So you have to find, you know, courts will move kind of more slowly. So you got to you know, figure out if, if this is your end game to end public financing of private projects, you know, how can we get there over time? What is the best set of facts, either in this case or in this case now, in the future case, um, in, in the future? Actually, I want to talk about one more case before I conclude, because I think it's an interesting one. And it involves um, economic interests. Um, so, uh, as you're probably aware, you need an occupational license to basically work in like half of the jobs in, in the United States now. Like a lawyer, I have to have a license, right? Which is nonsense. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to moderate my tone, but uh, maybe lawyers would argue that it's a little bit more justified, but I don't think so. But you need, you need a license to wash hair, to cut hair. You need a license in California if you want to do pest control. And not only pest control, but if you want to put up, you know, like those pigeon spikes on top of buildings to keep pigeons up, you need a license if you want to install pigeon spikes in the state of California. So you need to go to the government and say, hey, can I have permission, please, to install pigeon spikes? And the government will say, sure, after you take a thousand hour course that has nothing to do with installing pigeon spikes and you pay us, uh, you pay us our fair share, then yes, you can have your license. So in, um, in Arizona, there was a woman, um, Lauren Boyce, she lived down in Tucson and she was a uh, cancer survivor. And when she recovered uh, from her illness, she wanted to start a small business. Uh, when she was un undergoing chemo, she was homebound. So she couldn't go out to get her hair cut or her makeup done or whatever. So she started a business where she would dispatch 
licensed cosmetologists, so people who were licensed by the state to cut hair and do cosmetology services, to the homes of terminally ill, mostly terminally ill, but homebound patients. And that was her business. She was the operator. She was like the Uber. You know, she was connected to the driver of the passenger. Um, and uh, the state of Arizona called her up and said, um, uh, Ms. Boyce, um, what you're doing is cosmetology. You need a cosmetology license, which requires 1,800 hours of training and cutting hair and sanitation. It has nothing to do with dispatching services, of course. Um, and not only do you need a cosmetology license, um, you need to have a storefront in which to hang it so our inspectors can come by and make sure that your store is clean, even though there's going to be no services performed in your store where you're dispatching your cosmetology. So we looked at that and we're like, yeah, uh, that's a you know that's a real that's a real problem. Um, she just wants to earn an honest living. She just wants to start a business. The problem with these cases is that when you go to court, you're up against a, a standard of review called rational basis review that is like super de deferential to the government. It's basically any government action is going to be upheld by the court unless it's like clearly arbitrary. Unless it's so irrational. Now, this case was so irrational, we ended up uh, uh, winning after they tried to get the case dismissed. They, they lost and then settled, settled and allowed Lauren to, uh, to do a business without a license. Um, but we looked at that and we're like, look, there are so many entrepreneurs, there are so many small business owners that are being shut out before they even have a, a chance to get off the ground because of these occupational licenses or business permits or other restrictions. What can we do to make it easier for them? Um, one, to start their business, but two, to get relief in the event the government tries to overregulate them. And so we created um, what's called the Right to Earn a Living Act, which we've introduced um, uh, in Arizona this year. It was, um, it was uh, drafted by the Goldwater Institute, and then we introduced it in Arizona. We hope we'll have some success there. But what it does is two things. It says uh, state agencies, local governments, um, go back and look at all of your regulations, okay? If there's any regulation, that isn't related to a legitimate health and safety concern, you gotta get rid of it. So, uh, health and safety concern. There's no, there will still be a justification for cosmetologists, because arguably the public will go and they'll need to make sure that the tools are properly sanitized, even though of course the market can probably uh, make sure of that. But, uh, so there, there's probably a legitimate health and safety concern there. But what's not a health and safety concern, uh, gentlemen from New York will know, taxi medallions. Um, a lot of cities control the number of taxi medallions they give to taxi drivers. In New York, it was so restricted, so they, I don't know what the number was, maybe like 5,000 or something. It was so restricted, the number of medallions, that it cost a million dollars, one million dollars for a taxi driver to get permission from the city of New York to drive a taxi. So they would obviously take out mortgages and then become taxi drivers. Um, so that's not a legitimate health and safety concern. So if those regulations were to exist, then they would have to be repealed by the agency. And then the second part of the law said, <coughs> If you don't repeal these, then we can, uh, then anybody can come to court and can challenge them. And when they bring that challenge, it's not going to be this standard where any government action goes. The government's going to have to demonstrate it's necessary for health and safety purposes, and it's carefully tailored to achieve that purpose. So it bumps up that standard of judicial review to protect rights. You know, it's something kind of pretty close to like free speech protections. So that as we challenge these things, um, there'll be greater success in the courts, and then hopefully, you know, less regulatory. Uh, imposition down the line. So uh, we're, we're pretty excited about, about that one. That could be a real game changer. So I'll end with this, and then I want to hear, hear from you guys. Um, so next time you hear this term, judicial judicial activism, I think I think what people are saying when they say judicial activism, you got to be real careful, because what they're really probably advocating for is judicial abdication. I think a more apt term is judicial abdication or judicial lawlessness. Instead, I think we should embrace uh, judicial engagement, and that's courts uh, doing their proper role. They're keeping the other branches of government in check and allowing all of us, whether it's the big guy or the small guy, uh, to have our day, uh, to have our day before. So, uh, yeah, that's the thing. So you're talking about selecting a case properly. So I imagine that uh, with the Uber cosmetologist, if she had not been a cancer survivor, just a sympathetic client, but instead had, it was a, a convicted rapist who just got out and was trying to earn an honest living, you'd have a harder time arguing that case. 
none of the merits of the case, just because you've got an unsympathetic client. How many prospective cases do you think you guys review and then put aside because they're not the perfect one? The law, you know, I mean, one, it's got to be in our area. Two, the law's got to be in a, in, in a place where we think we're going to have a reasonable likelihood of success. And three, the facts have got to be good. You're right. I mean, like we, like for instance, right now, civil asset forfeiture is really bothering us. Now, that's an unconventional alliance kind of issue. This is where the government can basically seize private property without ever even charging somebody for crime, let alone convicting them of a crime. And then the government gets to keep the proceeds of the, of the forfeiture and use it for whatever police agency sees the property. They take your truck, they sell it, they get to keep the money and put it back into the police agency without very little due process protections. So that's something we want to take on. But finding a sympathetic plaintiff in that case, that's a tough deal, you know. Um, and now there's, there are plenty, because oftentimes the government goes a little bit rogue with some of these things, um, <coughs> forfeitures that they do, um, but it's a tougher thing. It's not Lauren Boyce, who was a businesswoman and a cancer survivor and just wanted to earn an honest living. So yeah, I mean, as you, exactly as you say, there's, there's a lot that you have to pass up. Are your donors impatient with you guys when you don't take, because I mean, there's tons of abuses donors really appreciate the fact that you have to properly select the case? Or, or is there pressure from like, my niece's truck got stolen. Yeah, she just got out of prison, but damn it, I gave you a thousand bucks. Like, is there, is there that kind of tension? You know, I think, I think our donors, I think they know, like, hey, look, we want to push, we want to push this, you know, we want to do the right thing in as many areas as we possibly <clears throat> can. And that requires strategic thinking in a lot of ways, and it requires thinking the right, the right case. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we'll, you know, we'll, we'll send, like, a, you know, someone will send us a case in for you and we'll look at it and be like, no, it's a good case, but it's not going to really establish any precedent. It's really going to apply just in this really small, narrow set of facts. Like, you know, we, we just can't do it. It's not, we, we can't invest the resources. Sometimes, you know, obviously, people are disappointed by that. But, you know, resources are finite, is all you fine economists know. Yeah. Would you all take, uh, say, a, a eminent domain type cases, like say the Kilo case or the Pole Town case, or you, you yeah. would take those? Yeah, we do those all the time. The Institute for Justice is kind of a specialist on that. My former boss, he was just appointed to the Arizona Supreme Court, uh, Clint Bullock is the founder of the Institute for Justice. Um, he, uh, he, he, he kind of did a lot of that private property thing uh, in his early career. Interestingly, we passed a law in Arizona called Prop 207 right after Kilo was decided. So this was a Supreme Court case where the city of New London, Connecticut, wanted to give a private developer, Pfizer, um, a plot of land to build a new Pfizer facility. And to do that, they stole the homes of many private citizens in New London, including this woman who was 84 years old and had lived in the home for generations and didn't want to sell her home to the government. She wanted to stay. And um, so it went to the Supreme Court, and the issue was, can the government take private property and give it to a private developer if there's gonna be jobs, tax revenue? Is that a public purpose? And the US Supreme Court said, yeah, yeah it's a public purpose in a 5-4 decision, which was outrageous. Yeah, it's particularly outrageous since the Constitution says a public use and not a public purpose. You got it, yep, yeah. you got it, yep, that's exactly right. And so the good thing, to happen in that case, as horrible as that case was, was that states started taking matters into their own hands, including Arizona, and the Gold Runners drafted a law that said, one, it has to be public use. This, is, this public purpose nonsense is not public use. So that's part one. Two, and this is where it was really revolutionary, um, we said that if the government imposes any regulation on your private property that impairs its value, so it gives you like some zoning or something, and a piece of property that's worth $100,000 is now worth fifty. You can file a claim with the government for the um, diminished uh, for the diminished value. So you can bet that governments aren't doing a lot of that stuff anymore in Arizona, and we're trying to get that replicated elsewhere. We did that by Citizens Initiative, so it's part of our uh, constitution. In the early 1800s, a lot of states tried to use taxpayer money for an, uh, internal improvement bills, you know, build roads, do uh, railroads, build canals. Yeah. And oh yeah. And all of them pretty much failed. Yep. And they all don't. So before, by the time the Civil War started, all but two states had put clauses in their state constitution saying that you couldn't, that the government couldn't give taxpayer money to these private companies yeah. for internal improvements. Uh, have you used any of that in Arizona? The, the, that's the clause. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly the, you're exactly that's the history. It was all these railroads that went under. 
Um, but a lot of the CDIs, you said exactly, 47 states, um, arguably 48, but 47 states um, have them. It's just that a lot of them have been laying kind of dormant until you, here's the thing too, the courts. The courts can't do anything on their own. You gotta bring the right cases to the court and then the, the courts can do it. So um, it, it, a lot of it is, is finding those right cases to, <coughs> to revitalize those provisions. John, pertaining uh, to your question here of the case about the police and the state legislators and all this, and being in the election cycle and you're just being slammed with all this, like you're the only front line for this. How really bought and paid are you know, the politicians and the CMs and the and all these people? Like, what do you see on the ground level when you're doing all these kind of cases? Like, uh, like you know, all these special interests are kind of like you know, moving uh, partisan lines. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you my personal two cents. Um, we don't, you know, oftentimes legislation is frustrating because we like to come at things from a pre pretty pure philosophical standpoint, and you know, politics requires compromise, you know, and oftentimes horse trading. And, you know, we don't like that. You know, we like to try and remain as consistent as possible, which is why we like the courts, it's left and right, uh, at least at the litigator side of our house does. Though we, we will do a little bit of policy as well down the legislature. Um, I don't know uh, to the extent to which politicians are actually bought and sold. Special interest influence is pervasive, um, and politicians have, as their public choice theory type stuff, survival on their mind. And if the police union comes out because you want to get rid of release time, which is a taxpayer abuse, that's going to piss them off. And in the next election cycle, you're going to say, oh, well, that politician hates cops and firefighters. And that's going to be the message they put out. So they're, not, so they're less inclined to do things, even if they know philosophically it's the right thing to do, they're less inclined to do it because of their um, interests. And that's my, my uninformed thought on that. I don't think that you're taking as full cognizance as I would like Ooh. on the evils of government. <laughs> 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 I've never heard that before. Please tell me what. <laughs> well, all this public interest stuff and public good and, and all, there ain't no such thing. Sure. There's only private interests. Uh, you know, you say, well, if they build a road or a highway, that's public good. Nonsense. Nonsense yeah. on stilts. Yeah. You know, uh, government socialized roads kill a lot of people. And, it's a bad thing, and, and somehow if, if it's given for a public purpose, that's okay. Uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Kinsella, talks about the Kilo case, and he says, look, uh, if the eminent domain was used for a public purpose, that would be okay. But if it's used for a private purpose, that's no good. But wait, private is better than government. Whereas you pinkos, you and Bill, <laughs> <laughs> talking about private property, okay? Um, because the, the, the property owners in New London have a fundamental right uh, to not have their property taken by the government. And I don't care if Donald Trump could have done a better job with her home. I don't care if anyone could, in the private sector could have done a better job with her home. In this country, private property means something, and uh, it means the government can't take it. So I don't, I don't view that as a, as a pro-government uh, pro -government position. I, I view that as a private property position, I think. In America, private property is one of the few first and fundamental rights that's protected by our Constitution. Um, 
But to the other stuff, I was actually just making a case that they make on the other side as to whether it's really a public use or not. Because a lot of stuff's not. A lot of stuff's not public purpose. I don't, you know, in a lot of ways, even roads, as you say, I mean, they're probably better if, if they're not in public hands. But those, I mean, those are my personal position. I was saying what they would argue, you know, on these issues in, in court. I respond. <laughs> I think you misconstrued what I said, or maybe I didn't say it clearly. Now, obviously, I agree with you. They shouldn't be grabbing Kilo's property. But I'm saying, stipulate that they grab Kilo's property. And now we have two uh, conclusions or two possibilities. One, they use it for a public purpose. The other, they use it for a private purpose. Yeah, I gotcha. And you're favoring the public purpose. Well, I, I, Given that they took Kilo's property, which we agree is improper because I don't believe But who, who decides property. these? Private purposes, you know, Pfizer. I mean, who decides? And then the government. Well, one is public, one is private. You're a G man. You're taking the public yeah. side. <laughs> Given that they that they uh, stole her property, which is bad. We agree. Right. Yeah. But now the choice is: where does the money go? Public or private? And you're favoring public. But who's making? And Walter, you're favoring a receiver of stolen property. Even though it's a private person, so you want to you want to the private fence than the public. Better a private receiver than a public receiver. You got the answer. You see, in class earlier today, no one like argued with him today, and so just off break, so Block really wants to fight. The New York Times would say that I favor Pfizer getting the money. I don't. I'm just saying, if they steal it, better to give it to a private. To a public. Yeah, I hope they don't steal it in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I agree exactly. with that. They shouldn't steal it in the first place, but given that they stole it in the first place, where should it go? Keep Not it. to the public. You go if with the private firm is getting the government to do its dirty work, it's not really acting like a private firm anymore. It's That's acting awesome. like a government. So it's kind of like saying, I didn't kill her. It's just the hitman I hired who did. Once <laughs> 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 so you stipulated that the government has taken the property, all bets are off. Right. Whoever who gets it, that's irrelevant. That's a good point. <laughs> 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 Mic <Mike> drop. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, nobody in here was saying that government was good or anything, but it's it's your uh, I would say perverse view that <laughs> Pfizer, okay, who was corrupting the government, no doubt, okay, even more than it would have been, okay, was better for Pfizer, this corrupter, to get the the, the land than the government. When in point of fact. Pfizer built the facility and within a few years it was shut down and the whole area is a wasteland now and I doubt that the results would be have been as bad if the government had put it to some quote public use, a true public use. 
For example, a park. If the government had just turned it into a park, it would have been a better result than what they got with Pfizer. Go look at a picture of what New London looks like now, okay? And so we have to use facts in here, and we have to stay away from novels, okay? And even if the novels are written by Ayn Rand, um, we have to stay away. We have to go to facts, Walter. But isn't that looking in retrospect, though? Like, what if the Pfizer facility had succeeded? Isn't I'm, I'm sorry. I think just it's listening to all this, <laughs> and it's starting from a logically unsound place. So it's not even an argument. It started from the idea that the government just took the land without Pfizer having any interest that prompted it. That's at least what it sounds like to me. So. If the government just took the land without that, then maybe there's a leg to stand on in this argument here. But if they didn't, then it feels like we've already figured out what went wrong here. I'm <laughs> Can you tell us more about the case that you did in uh, Louisiana on school choice? Sure, yeah. It, it, actually, this was pretty complicated, so I'll try, I'll try my best to distill it. So in um, 2012, as you guys might know, the state of Louisiana passed um, a pretty good school choice program. It was available to students that came from failing schools, what the state graded as C, D, or F schools, and not below a certain um, a poverty uh, line. Okay, so poor kids from bad schools well, were available for vouchers. They could then take the school choice, the school voucher, and spend it at the, uh, the school of their choosing. Um, the federal government came in, the Department of Justice, and they used a case that. So following school desegregation after Brown v. Board, a lot of southern states um, were still finding ways to get money to racially segregate, to rate to non, so I'm sorry, to race to non-integrated schools. Okay. So in Louisiana, arguably was doing this with private schools by giving transportation and textbook funding to some private schools that weren't yet integrated. So this ended up in litigation, the Department of Justice got involved in the early 70s. And then the state of Louisiana ended up settling the case in a consent decree um, where the state of Louisiana is basically like, okay, no more uh, state money to schools that are integrated. And that was the whole case. Okay? No one can argue with the facts of that, I don't think. The Department of Justice took that case and came in, because it's still open, a consent de decree is still in force in the Eastern District of Louisiana. And they took it and they came to court and they said, hey, we don't know what the hell this school choice program is doing because it's taking poor kids out of failing schools who may have a particular racial composition and sending them to other schools and we don't know if this is messing up the racial composition that we, the federal government, in our infinite wisdom, think is appropriate. Um, so they tried to reopen um, that order and apply it to this um, voucher program. Um, unfortunately, the, the, so the state of Louisiana was represented by its own attorneys, but we represented parents and students. Um, the state of Louisiana basically was like, uh, maybe the federal court has jurisdiction here, but we came in and we go, yeah, you don't even have jurisdiction. I mean, you can't use a 50-year-old order that has nothing to do with the current facts, that has nothing to do with the program that was enacted in 2012, and apply it to that program. Um, judge, you, your order is null because you don't have authority to impose it in the first place. And so that was, that was the case. It went up to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they agreed with us and, and eliminated the federal government's oversight over this school uh, choice program. That's our time. Please don't come in. Come and take our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.